So you're eager to play Wrath and Glory, but don't want to be bogged down by reading a 400-page rulebook. I get it. We've all been there. Look no further. Here, I will guide you through the core mechanics to get you kick-started, whether it's for a one-off evening with your mates, or the start to a full-blown campaign. First of all, you should bring yourself to life in the world of the 41st millennium. There's the traditional way to sit down with a pen and paper and do this in a session zero, but for now, let's do this as simply and efficiently as possible. Wrath and Glory has a tier system of 1 to 4 that generally encapsulates four different difficulty settings. Those tiers determine the amount of experience points and archetypes you can play. It's best first to find out where your adventure will sit, and then this can then determine which archetypes are available to you. At this stage, you should be communicating with your GM and they should be giving you a tier to work towards. Once you have the tier of the adventure figured out, you can narrow down your archetype. Remember, you can also select the archetype below the suggested tier and simply apply the correct amount of XP points for that tier bracket. To show this as an example, I'll be picking the Croup Mercenary Tier 1 archetype from the Forsaken System Player's Guide official supplement for a Tier 2 game. For character creation, I strongly recommend using the Doctors of Doom character creation tool to keep things simple. It does much of the background work for you and it will save you a ton of time. Just remember to download the long code and save it somewhere so that you can access your character in the future. The link to the website will be in the video description. So first we create a blank character. Then we choose the correct adventure tier, in this case, tier two. You can see down the left hand side, the calculator is keeping track of all your experience points. Our species for this will be Crute. As you can see, unlike the human, the Crute species costs points. This is because he comes with a bunch of extra stats and abilities baked in. I'll add the choices for those abilities that he has. You'll find that with other species, they have their own unique abilities as well. Now select your archetype. For this, we have a tier one option, the mercenary. Don't worry if your adventure is a tier two or higher. We have the appropriate experience points to spend and beef him up to match the difficulty. It's worth noting that some archetypes are strictly locked to a certain species or faction, so bear this in mind. Here's the stats section. You may find yourself switching between this one and the war gear and the talent sections to tweak and balance your character to your liking. I'm going to build a Kroot mercenary who loves to swing a chainsword around, so I'll prioritise his survivability and his strength. Talents are controversial to some people. Those who like to min-max their stats rarely, if ever, bother with them. I for one like their flavour, and in the past I've given my players free talents instead of their allocated experience points cost, just so they have something to play with. Here, I give my crew the Brutalist talent, so that his melee attacks are particularly nasty. On the next tab we have War Gear. You can get some War Gear for free as part of your archetype and species, but you are also welcome to buy more here at your GM's discretion. My Crew Warrior is a combat fighting machine, and as such I've spoken to my GM and he has okayed a chainsword for my character. The next tab is the Psychic Powers tab. It's important to note that you need the Psychic Keyword from the Talents tab in order to access the Psychic Powers. My crew is not a Psyker, so I will skip this tab. There are other details you can choose, such as backgrounds and objectives, and you're welcome to create your own with the help of your GM if some of these do not suit your character idea. Some backgrounds offer bonuses to your character for free, so don't forget to add them. Once done, Click the small page icon to have your character sheet in front of you. It's advised that you print this or save it to your desktop for easy reference. Looks like we're ready to play. Wrath and Glory is a D6 dice pool system set within the 40k universe. This means that you gather an appropriate pool of standard D6 dice to roll for tests. As a quick example, if you're attempting to shoot something, climb something, or even persuade someone, you gather the appropriate amount of d6 dice and roll against the set difficulty that your games master will require. These difficulty levels, or DNs, are sometimes a secret, however the GM will let you know if you have succeeded or failed. 
There are several different scenarios to making tests. Most will come under three main categories that give you the value of the amount of dice you need to roll. The first is an attribute test, using the appropriate attribute only. The second is a skill test, which uses the total value of your skill and attribute combined. And the third are combat related tests. When dice are rolled, a 1, 2 and 3 are failures and discarded. A 4 or 5 counts as one icon, or successful roll. A 6 counts as two successful rolls towards your goal. These successful rolls are called icons, and the 6 is called an exalted icon. As a general rule, bar a few exceptions, you will include one die of a different colour in your total amount of d6. This die acts as your wrath die. The wrath die acts just like the other dice, adding to your score, but with one exception. On the roll of a 1, there is a negative complication with the action being performed. This usually comes in the form of a narrative, but in combat situations it can also come as a weapons jam or similar effect. If the wrath die is a 6, there is a positive effect, and the player gains a glory point. In a combat situation, this also becomes a critical hit. Now that we've touched upon glory points, let's go over wrath, glory, and ruin points, and what they all do. So what is glory? Glory is the result of gaining 6 on your wrath die, and the accumulative amount of these glory points is shared amongst your comrades as a group resource. At the start of each session, your team will begin with no glory points at all, and this will grow as you adventure along and roll well on your wrath die. The maximum glory you can have in the group is either 6, or the number of players in your group plus 2, whichever works out to be the greater. Gaining glory happens in two ways. Either you roll a 6 on the wrath die, or you shift during a test. Shifting will be covered a little later. Spending glory is used in several ways. You can use one to add to your dice pool of a roll, to increase the damage you have dealt, to apply a more severe critical hit, or to seize an initiative and go first. Wrath is your individual resource. Each session, you begin play with two wrath points to spend, and can gain wrath points to an unlimited amount. These are given to you by the GM for things like good role playing or accomplishing a personal goal or objective. Wrath points can be used on things like re-rolling failed test die or a narrative declaration. It can also restore shock to your character. Ruin is the GM's personal resource and they can begin play each session with the amount of ruin equal to the number of players in the group, capping at a maximum of twice the number of players. This resource is usually hidden from players but GMs can utilise announcing using a ruin point to add a dramatic effect to an encounter, or simply just for clarity. GMs can gain ruin in three different ways. A player fails a corruption test, fails a fear test, or if the GM rolls a 6 on the wrath die. The GM can choose to spend a ruin die in a similar way to both wrath and glory points combined. To re-roll failures, seize initiative, restore shock to an adversary, roll a determination test, or activate a special Ruin action exclusive to certain adversaries. If you succeed with more than one Exalted Icon, you may use that spare Exalted Icon to grant additional benefits for the skill test. This is known as Shifting. It is your choice as a player how you'd like to spend this bonus. Some examples are bonus information, excelling at a success, lowering the amount of time it takes to perform an action, extra damage, or adding one to your party's glory pool. In combat, when rolling for a hit test, you can shift an extra exalted icon for an extra damage die, but more on that later. Combat begins in the following steps. First, the GM describes the scene you find yourselves in. This includes whether or not you are considered ambushed, any environmental hazards, or points of interest or objects that may prove useful. Next, the party will pick the person who will go first. There might be a lengthy discussion, so you might want to just select someone who is being more aware or who was closer to the enemy at the time. This is a great determining factor for who goes first as a general rule, but it can be situational to the narrative. If no one can decide, you can simply roll an initiative test. The GM goes next with a single enemy. It then goes back to the players and so forth in turns. During a combat scenario, there's a certain amount of things you can do realistically in the time frame of your turn. Typically, you can only perform one of each of these actions, unless otherwise explained. A movement action, like running for cover or approaching an enemy. A combat action, such as taking a swing with your chainsaw or shooting with your bolter. A simple action, 
such as drawing and readying a weapon or kicking open a locked door, a reflexive action such as taking an attack at an enemy trying to move away from you, a number of free actions such as shouting a short sentence or rolling determination, and a full round action such as sprinting, charging or using full defence. A full action uses up all of your turn's action economy, meaning it is the only action you can perform at that turn. There are a multitude of more advanced actions you can take, but for now, we'll keep things simple. Here's an example of play. Here, our players stumble upon two poxwalkers who jump out from behind a container. The priest, caught off guard, gets struck first. Then it's his turn. He draws his chainsword using a simple action, and then he moves backwards to avoid danger using a movement action. The poxwalker takes a reflexive action to do a reflexive attack on the priest, but luckily it misses. The first poxwalker takes his turn to move forward slowly. It has no ranged weapons, so its turn ends there. The sister of battle, ever diligent, has been walking with her bolt gun in her hands. She chooses to perform a combat action to shoot the poxwalker and blows its head off. She can choose to move if she wishes, but she decides to remain stationary. The second porkswalker moves up. The marine, chainsword already in hands, decides to charge, making a full round action. As part of the charge action, he may make a single attack and cuts the final poxwalker in half. With the threats out of the way, that resolves combat. Let's talk about how to do a combat test. Firstly, you declare an attack. For example, the Space Marine might want to shoot the Demon Spawn, seen here. You roll to hit the creature. For a ranged attack, use your agility value and your ballistic skill value. Let's assume the Marine has an agility of 4 and a ballistics of 3, meaning 7 total dice to roll. Remember, one of these will be your Wrath die, and therefore should be a different colour to the rest. This is a roll against the Demon's defence, and in this case, it's a defence of 3. The Marine player has a roll of 5 in total, meaning he has beaten and therefore hit the Demon. Because the marine player has two extra successes in the form of an exalted icon, that player can choose to shift that dice to the pool of extra damage, or ED dice, to the damage of the weapon. The marine player will now roll to see how much damage the weapon has caused. A bolt gun's damage profile is 10 plus 1 ED. ED stands for extra damage, and you roll a dice for every ED, adding to the number of icons the total amount of damage caused. Because the marine player decided to shift an exalted icon from the hit roll, he will get a total of 2 ED. The marine player then rolls a 4 and a 6 from his ED, resulting in an extra 3 damage in total, making the total damage 13. Note, the wrath die on a damage roll does not have any added effects. The demon has a resilience of 10. You deduct any armour penetration, or AP, from this first, and then deduct the amount of damage. The demon has 3 wounds inflicted upon it. A 6 on the Wrath die during a hit roll will inflict 1 extra damage. This damage converts into 1 wound even if the target's resilience is not beaten, and is called a critical hit. There is a critical hit table you can choose to roll on, with effects, otherwise the simplified rule is just to add 3 ED and a narrative effect of the player's choice to the damage. So just to overview, ranged attack is agility plus ballistic skill and ranged damage is the damage value of the weapon with any extra damage dice. A melee attack is initiative plus weapon skill, and the melee damage is calculated by using the damage value of the weapon, any extra damage dice, and the strength of the character. To inflict wounds, you take the target's resilience, take away any armour penetration from that, and then remove any wounds from that as well. So what if you get hit back? Unlike most RPGs, you don't usually automatically take the wounds that an enemy has done to you. There are a couple of systems in place that make you feel more heroic and survivable. If you take a wound, or multiple wounds, you can roll a determination test to convert them into shock. Shock represents your mental fortitude in the face of combat and potential death. You start play with zero shock, and certain attacks or psychological assaults can cause you to suffer shock. If you suffer more shock than your maximum shock, you count as exhausted, meaning you can only walk, crawl, or perform a basic unmodified combat action. If your shock is reduced and gotten rid of, you are no longer exhausted and may take actions normally. You may use your combat action and expend a point of wrath to restore shock equal to your rank plus your tier. 
To do a determination roll, you roll a number of dice equal to your toughness. Every icon you roll reduces the number of wounds you suffer by one and causes you to suffer one shock. When you take a determination text, follow these steps. Roll a dice pool equal to your toughness attribute. Count the total icons. Each icon converts one wound into one shock. Once you take a single wound, you are under the wounded condition. This causes any tests you take to be at a plus one DN difficulty. Hopefully it never comes to this, but when you've taken more than your maximum wounds allow, you are in the dying condition. You suffer from a memorable injury and you fall prone. If you then take more traumatic injuries than your tier plus one, you die. There are two types of recovery, regroup and respite. Regroup is downtime of approximately an hour, and a player with a Medicaid rating can heal a single character at a rate of wounds equal to their Medicaid dice pool. Respite is a period of rest more than six hours or longer, and offers a complete removal of shock, wounds, and a reset of your wrath points back to two, even if you had gained extra during the same session. I hope you found this guide to be helpful, and in the future I'll expand on it with some advanced guides to things like psychic tests, status conditions, advanced actions, and more. Many thanks for listening.